I'd like to welcome Dr. Sean Wise. How are you doing today, Sean? I am great. The kids are almost back to school. Yay! <laughs> and I imagine, our, our, is it like that, uh, was, is it Staples or was it a Walmart commercial that did the, uh, the happiest time of the year where all the parents were uh, <laughs> in the shopping cart? My wife cart, and I so. are getting ready to celebrate and do dance. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. And um, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Sean Wise is the professor of entrepreneurship at Ryerson University, was the entrepreneur in residence for the first five years as Dragon, uh, of Dragon's Den. Uh, I'm not sure, how long were you with Shark Tank? Uh, when they did the transition. So when Kevin and, and Robert Herjavec went down there, that's when I got to observe them. And, and after that, you know, you went moved in front of the camera for The Naked Entrepreneur. You've written five books on entrepreneurship. Um, I've, your students, from what I've read, and you know, I could be wrong, has seen over $2.1 billion in investment. Um, you've seen over 30,000 venture pitches. The list goes on and on. I, thank you for taking the time and joining us today. Well, I, I want to thank you for calling my mom and getting all of this background information about me. Well, uh, I, we've known each other for a little while. I think we met um, when it was the book launch for Startup Opportunities. Yeah, 2012. Yeah, I guess it was. I, I, so at some point, I don't want to date myself anymore. I get so old. But yeah, it, it was uh, speaking. It was you and Brad Feld. And I remember uh, in the room when we were launching Startup Toronto, Brad Feld asked, um, uh, are any of you entrepreneurs? If you remember, there was like, I don't know, 12 of us in the room. And I had my hand halfway up because uh, I just started a business. I didn't know if I was or not. Um, and all those other people who are part of Startup Toronto are gone. Uh, and I agreed to to run one event. And, <laughs> and time, now here you are as the as kingpin of Startup well, Opportunities in Toronto. Yeah, so it was. It's just been an interesting journey um, through all of that, and you know the inspiration of getting the startup communities and and uh, helping young entrepreneurs and old entrepreneurs, early stage entrepreneurs is what we focus on here uh, to begin and grow. You've been definitely an inspiration of ours and helped us uh, with space and connections and all that kind of stuff. It, you've really been a strong supporter. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So. We are talking about mistakes that entrepreneurs make, and you've uh, been in the business working with startups for a long, long time, and you've seen uh, spectacular failures and spectacular successes. Uh, so where do we want to start? Well, you know what? In an age of Trump, I think it's important to start with context. I teach all my students that you shouldn't just listen to what people say. You should understand where they're coming from. So I'll apologize to our audience in advance. It's not very Canadian, but I'm going to talk about myself. And hopefully that will give you a little bit of background. And then you challenged me to narrow the list down to three mistakes. I must have gone through like a hundred of them and tried to figure out which ones were the same and which ones were different. I'm sure I've missed something, but I think what would be best if I, if I just show you what I put together and then you see if they can. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see that? Great. Uh, so my name is Sean Wise. I've been an entrepreneur since 13. I took my first company public at 31. Uh, I've been Canada's national mentor of the year as well as a national fellow. I've toured our great country both on behalf of Dragon's Den on, on behalf of our prime minister's office. Um, but I, I, I'm not just a, a mouthpiece about entrepreneurship. I'm not just a pundit. I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, I sold my most recent company less than two years ago. It was my fifth startup. Uh, I've had two you know, 10x, 100x returns and three huge, massive failures. So I've learned a lot from both. And then I've been privileged to, to learn a lot both from Dragon's Den and from my own show, The Naked Entrepreneur. I will caution the audience not to Google the naked entrepreneur without quotes. If you do that, you're going to get something completely unrelated to me. Um, I am a, a tenure professor at the Ted Rogers School. Uh, I, myself, from a background perspective, studied engineering and economics. In my undergrads, I have an MBA in finance and a corporate law degree from a law school in Ottawa. Uh, and my PhD is from the University of Glasgow. But most importantly, I've spent my time as an investor for the last 20 years. I do most of the work I do today with Ryerson Futures, which is a seed fund in Toronto, obviously associated with the school. Uh, these are some of our investments from the last few years. And so what I want to share with you today is, is what I've learned through this process. And I'll try to make it uh, 
painless so that we can get to the Q&A. In reverse order, after much, much debate between myself and my colleagues, I want to present my three biggest mistakes. Now, before I get started, remember, an entrepreneur includes all kinds of things, small business owners, professional service companies, uh, one-person shows, entrepreneurs, gratepreneurs, uh, first-time founders, startup founders. There's a big, big thing out there. So I had to really kind of figure out what applies not only to where I spend my time, high-tech startups, million-dollar companies, but to all the people who are benefiting through entrepreneurship. Because like, like you, Craig, I believe that entrepreneurship really empowers everybody. And whenever there's a change in our society, like the pandemic is bringing along, like social injustice, it's the entrepreneurs that bring commercial solutions. It's not the only part of the solution, but that often changes everything. Think about how much change we've had since email has been invented. Think about how much change we've had since GPS has been in a phone. How much change have we had since we could Zoom anybody? So all of these changes lead to unmet market needs and all these unmet market needs, they lead to great entrepreneurship. Whether you're a new mask maker or you have a piece of software that allows you to use infrared to detect an elevated temperature. There's so much going on here. So it was difficult, but I'm going to start with number three. Uh, this, reminds, this is one of my favorite shark, shark tanks. It's the, it's the you smell business. And, um, and, 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 and really the, the problem wasn't the idea. I know that everyone wants to think it's all about the perfect idea, but ideas are worthless. It's really about the execution. And so if you spent five years in your basement working on a business plan that's 100 pages big, you're already dead. You're already dead in the water because we don't know. We know that doesn't work. Business plans are dead, but business planning is not. We just use different tools. And in the 21st century, the biggest tool is getting off of your tush on the couch. You know, when I was with Dragons Den, a lot of people asked me why I would let anyone get on stage if I didn't think they had a shot or if I didn't think their idea was great. And I told them the same thing. Number one, it's not for me to decide what your idea is good or not, it's for your customers. And number two, you always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So it's really easy to be a entrepreneur and sit on your couch and watch Shark Tank and yell at the screen and tell them how, how they're not perfect and what are they doing. It's a lot harder to be that person. And so I always say to people, just get started. I'm not telling you to quit your job and sell your children for science and found a company with billions of dollars, but get out of your house get out of the building go talk to potential early adopters don't worry about people stealing your idea worry about people not even knowing or ever understanding your idea and so what i would always encourage people uh, it's not not to plan it's to draw a line in the sand after you've done the basic planning and then go test your assumptions don't just keep making the plan perfect without input from outside sources so the number one mistake I find all entrepreneurs, including small business people, big business people, tech people is they want to overthink it. They want to, they get stuck in analysis paralysis. They think that they're going to find the right price by doing some kind of math. You can't, you need real humans, buyers, customers, early adopters. So get started. Uh, this is one that Brad taught me, my mentor, Brad Feld. And, and, and he taught me that, that you got to stop talking and start walking. You've got to show me things, not tell me things. So, you know, when you start off a new business, there's a lot of assumptions who your customer is, where you're going to find them, what you can charge, how you're going to get value. And, and, and you don't want to tell people that you're going to have a great company. You want to show people you have a great company. So a guy named Stuart Butterfield uh, is my favorite example of this. The founder of Slack came out of Vancouver. You know, he didn't stand up in front of investors and say, Slack is great. People love us. He put up a chart that showed the daily active user growth. Day over day, what percentage was growing? And when you see a chart like this, it weighs much more than your two cents. You know, it's really easy to make subjective statements. Our customers love us. We're better than Google. But it's a lot harder to use key performance indicators, to use real metrics to say week over week growth of users has gone up 13.4%. I believe that a lot more than you telling me my mom thought it was a great idea, right? So I think too many people aren't doing the work, aren't providing third-party evidence, aren't finding the key performance indicators because they're stuck still analyzing. It's not necessary. Come up with your idea, come up with the assumptions, test the assumptions, risky as first, churn those assumptions into knowledge and go forward step by step. 
And that leads me to uh, the last point on the second mistake. This is what very common on Dragon's Den. People will come in and say, I have 3,000 customers. Now, if you have 3,000 paying customers and you had zero last week, that's huge. But if you had 3,000 paying customers today and last week you had 30,000 paying customers, that's the opposite of huge. And if you had 3,000 customers last week and we don't know if that's a one-off because it's only one data point, I can't even use it. So you'll always hear investors talking about lines, not dots. They're talking about trends. What is the week over week revenue growth? What is the week over week uh, churn? What is the week over week ROI on Facebook ads? But it's the week over week growth, the line, not the dot. Because I don't know if 30,000 paying customers are good because each customer pays $19.99 a month or it's bad because each customer pays nine cents a month. I, I don't know. But people get stuck with these vanity metrics, like how many people clicked on my link instead of talking about things that are actionable. And that leads me to the number one mistake. The number one mistake that I came up with after thinking was people still think it's 1997, 1998, 1999. So let's go back to that time period. I was a young stud fresh out of law school working at a venture group in New York City. And every Thursday night we would go out to a bar near Wall Street and people would literally show up with napkins and draw up ideas and ask for millions. And that was called the dot-com boom. And it was crazy. I was so young. I didn't know what was going on. It was like a height of, of euphoria. And people got checks based on like concepts and got checks based on business plans. But the problem was those checks had to be in the millions. Because remember in 1997, you didn't have Shopify. You didn't have Google. You didn't have universal sign-in through Facebook. You didn't have PayPal and merchant engine. You had to create everything. So my sister, is a small businesswoman. She creates jewelry. And if she wanted to have a jewelry store in 1997, she'd have to find a way to get customers, find a way to process transactions. She'd have to write all the code herself. There was no drag and drop. You know, that none of that infrastructure was there. It was like going to an undiscovered country and there was nothing, no, ra no radio, no electricity, no nothing. But by 2008, 10 years later, when we entered Web 2.0, those tools were already being developed. And so the cost to launch drops from say $2 million to half a million dollars. But then as you fast forward again, 10 years to 2018, that price has dropped less than $500. My nephew in a Shopify account could create the same store that we created in 1997, except he wouldn't take $5 million in three years. He'd take a weekend, $500 in a Timbits booth card. Right. So because the costs have dropped so low, there's no more. I have to wait till funding until I launch. There's no more. I don't know what customers are. I'm keeping it secret. So today, friends and family and founders are expected to fund their business until revenue. VCs are not going to write million dollar checks till a company has found its product market fit. And that's not so bad because now it costs so much less. Geography and funding are really not a constraint. Customers are available online. Now, that does have a negative problem too. If you're an investor, everyone thinks they have the next great thing. And because it only costs $500, the amount of business ideas I see has gone up dramatically. Everybody's got to start. That's not the same thing as everyone has a great opportunity. But again, because we've seen this, the dot-com boom, the web 2.0 in our current age of unicorns, we're able to learn how it's been done. So don't think it's 1999 where we don't know how to create a startup. It, it, it's 2020. We absolutely have 21 years of understanding how startups get developed. And we call that the lean startup methodology or agile development, or some people call it a variation of design thinking, right? And it's this whole idea that you don't wait to be perfect, that ready, aim, fire is now ready, fire, aim. And, and so it's not as bad as it once was where, where we had to spend 50 hours writing a business plan. Now we use something called a lean canvas. And most of all, we know the path to success. When Craig and I were in school in the late 90s, if you wanted to learn how to be a successful entrepreneur, they gave you a book on Benjamin Frank. They don't give you instructions on how to do it. Well, 20 years later, we know the answers to these questions, right? We found the secret formula. Ready, fire, aim, repeat. Ready, fire, aim, repeat. Everyone got it. We can go home now. Everyone knows how to make millions. Not so quick. 
right? So over time, we evolved that and, and academics got into it and they wrote pretty diagrams. You know, you take an idea, you create a hypothesis based on your assumptions, you design a test or an experiment, and then based on the results, you either run the test again with a small change, like a price change, or you keep moving forward. So again, now that you know that, we can all go home and be millionaires. No, it's not that easy, right? I thought it was because I took it and, and took it to my students. And unfortunately, this is what I got. I got a lot of quizzical looks. So the Lean Startup really has its origins at the University of California and at Stanford and Dr. Steve Blank. And Dr. Steve Blank, who's my professor, also taught a guy named Eric Reese. And Eric Reese wrote the book and went on to Harvard. But my students at Ryerson aren't Harvard and my students aren't MIT engineers, and they're certainly not Stanford grad students. So this wasn't enough. They just wasn't. My students didn't know what to do with this. So we had to spend a lot of time evolving it, and so we evolved it into this. You know, you start with identifying a customer group and, and then finding a problem the group has that's worth solving and creating a canvas, like a little, for one page business plan as my partner Shari likes to call it. And, and we go through this whole process. But unfortunately, students still needed more direction. And so we had to break it down. Now, we're not alone in this. Stanford breaks it down, MIT breaks it down, but Bill all led at MIT, his students only need 24 steps. My students need 100 steps to start up. And so we've been teaching this now for a few years. We know it works. We have got several students who have gone on to do quite well and we're happy with them, but it's not just for students and it's not just for startups. This is the same path you would take for a small business. This could be the same path you take for a solopreneur. But basically it is the fact that we've learned this path from Tinder, from Google, from Yahoo. We've seen Amazon do these various steps. No one's ever stopped to explain it. And that's really what we try to do. So, you know, we created this program called 100 Steps. It's really a, a hundred, um, closer to 200 short instructional videos and worksheets and exercises. And it's all about finding a path from your initial idea to, to revenue while not risking everything. And we've tested it now for a few thousand entrepreneurs. Uh, those people who often like it are first time founders, those that want to make less mistakes, uh, people who are keeping their job until they have a lot, enough evidence, people who, who really are doing a side hustle and they want to see if it can be something real. And, and I can be. So we like to say, always know what to do to do next. And I guess the number one biggest mistake I would talk about is the fact that you're thinking it's 1999 and we don't have all of this information that we have. And we don't have all of these role models that we have. And I'm open for questions. That's all I got to say. That was great. I appreciate was that. Okay? I, yeah, that, I like the uh, it's thinking it's not 1999 anymore. And the Prince song went through my head. But at the same time, it's so true that we used to have to build the thing a certain way. If you had a jewelry store, you'd actually have to have a brick and mortar place. Um, and I don't know how many people in the chat room has ever had to apply for a merchant uh, account out of a bank. So you can take debit or visa before. But that process is like, I'd rather get my eyes scraped. So it, it, That it, process has gone from months to minutes. And we and, can be at home not even wearing pants. Like on the computer, typing away, right? So uh, I think you got to remember, you just may be holding on to outdated myths. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat room already. So uh, keep them coming. And I've got a couple of questions. So why don't we start with, you know, the common wisdom in startups is don't do everything yourself. But at the same time, don't hire too soon. Um, they seem to be in conflict. So how do you know it's the right time to either outsource something or to hire? Well, that's a great question. And I think it's, a, it's one of the key catch 22s of entrepreneurship. Um, so I, I would look at it a different way. I don't think it's a matter of timing. I think it's a matter of task. I think if a task is core competency, something that is your business's competitive advantage, you should never outsource it. If it is not your competitive advantage, like say filing taxes, bookkeeping, you should outsource it. Now, I would also add one small caveat. And that is that you should never outsource what you haven't done yourself. So I'm not saying you should keep your own books forever, but you should set up your own books. I'm not saying you can't hire a salesperson, 
but the first two dozen sales should be you. You shouldn't outsource the sweeping of the floor until you've swept the floor enough to know what's efficient and inefficient. And I think that people want to jump and I don't like bookkeeping and I don't like sales, so let's outsource it. You're crippling yourself. In those early days, you need that face time with customers. You need to understand your business. So don't outsource anything for the first few months and then divide tasks into two categories, core competency or ready to outsource. The next follow-up for that would be, you know, having the wrong co-founder, and this happens so often, can so sink often. any business. And I get a lot of co-founders looking for a co-founder. Someone shows up in front of my door and say, I'm looking for a co-founder. Where do I find one? Like there's a closet you can just pick one out of. So is there a right way or a wrong way to find a co-founder? So it's actually not true anymore, Craig. You can go into the closet and get some. The, the closet is called founderdating.com or it's called uh, Founder Lab or Founder Co-Dating. You just Google Founder Dating. It's not about getting uh, a romantic date. It's about uh, aligning yourself. And they've got all kinds of cool tools, you know, check how you work versus how they work. So, you know, see if what your Myers-Briggs is and all of those things. In the end, I have two pieces of advice. The first is try before you buy. Before you buy the cow, try the milk. Try to see how that person works, find a project that you can work on together, something small and encapsulated, because everyone looks great on day one and very few people look great on day 100. So I always say, try before you buy. Don't jump into a partnership, give someone 50% of your company and then worry that you've got the wrong person. But not only is it important where you find them, it's important sort of what, what, what ways you evaluate them. So I once wrote an article on this exact topic around marriage and around partnership and around starting co-founders. And in the end, I found that the best thing to do is a three-part test. So part one is to see how they act when their guard is dialed. Everyone sounds great in the boardroom, but after a few bottles of wine at the end of the night, people's true intentions come out, people get sloppy. And you know what, that's okay, because they're humans. But you wanna know what they're really like when there's no uh, face paint on and, and everything good. So I'm not encouraging people to drink tons of alcohol. I'm encouraging not to be a co-founder with someone you haven't seen when their guard is down. Number two, I think you can judge a person by how they react in a crisis. More importantly, I would argue that entrepreneurship is a series of ordered chaos crises. So you're always in a crisis mode. So if this person reacts by smashing a glass and stomping out, maybe that's not for you. Unless you're in the Greek wedding business, then maybe that is for you. But my point is that you shouldn't see someone just perfect. You want to see things when the poop hits the fan. You want to see people when they're, do they take responsibility? Do they try to blame other people? Do they lose their mind? Do they focus on solutions? So step one, see how they are when their guard is down. Step two, see how they react when the poop hits the fan. And step three is very much related to step two. And it's very much about how, watch how they spend their money, not how they talk about their money. But when they have a great year, do they say we should give it all to the staff or do they take it all for themselves? Uh, when they get paid, are they buying flashy cars or paying for their mother's hospital bills? There's no right or wrong answer to any of these three questions, but you should be comfortable with your partner's answers regardless of what they are. But if you aren't comfortable or worse yet, you don't even know how they deal when their guard is down, how they deal when things go wrong how they deal with money when things go right, you're setting yourself up for a big, big problem. So that's my advice. Right now, co-founders do not need to be geo-located. They can be anywhere in the world, as long as you don't mind time zones. And, uh, and I think that if you can find someone that matches up to you on these three criteria, then you're off to the races. And you mentioned a couple of these co-founder, co-founder coffee. What were uh, a couple of the other ones you mentioned? I'd have to look them up and okay. send you the list. Would so Google them. Yeah, there's a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, and Daniel from the chat room says, hi, uh, Dr. Wise. I was in ENT 500 with you last year and loved it. I was wondering what your thinking is on channel sales model, such as partnering with a larger startup for an enterprise B2B software solution where my target demographic is larger institutions that are hard to conduct a sales cycle with. 
Wow, that is a very explicit question, Daniel. It, it, I, I, great to see you. I, I don't know why after taking my course you want more of me, but I'm happy that you do. Um, I think that if you're in a B2B space, you have to be ready for a very different sales cycle. Most of my investments are in B2B companies, companies that sell to other companies. And there's a lot of problems when startups do that. The, the biggest one is reputational risk. You know, RBC will pay more for a product, but they're very adverse to buying a product from a startup because they worry about the feedback. So when we had companies like Sensible have to sell to banks, you know, they had to switch from a six month sales cycle mentality to a two year sales cycle mentality. But 20 banks later, it's a lot easier. So I think anytime you can partner up, anytime that you can get the halo or the support of another organization, then you're going to have a better chance. So for instance, Ryerson Futures often reached out to financial institutions on behalf of our startup. What we would do is I would go through the alumni database, see who works there, see who at RBC is highest up, and I'd call them. We have a company at Ryerson Futures that would really love your feedback. We're not selling you anything. We were totally selling them everything. We're not gonna sell you anything. I just wanna bring the guys and gals over so that they can. And you'd end up in a boardroom with the management committee of RBC thinking that they're doing some great deed, and they're really just doing customer interviews. But because it came under the Ryerson banner, because they wore Ryerson t-shirts, it gave them that effect. So I'm a big fan of that. Anytime you can get into a, a marketplace using someone else's clout, goodwill, it's a starting point until you at least have your own built up. I hope that helps Daniel and it's good to see you again or hear from you again. And we had another question from the chat room, you know, about how important is a well thought through and detailed business plan uh, to a startup now, you know, in the 2020? Zero importance, zero. I'm not talking about business planning. Business planning is as important as always, but a business plan, this 100 page, perfectly proofread, ideal document, I wouldn't read it in a million years. So I wouldn't invest any time in that. That doesn't mean you're not gonna invest time on the topics covered by that. Things like revenue models and channels to get to customers, but you're gonna do it in a more efficient, dynamic way. Instead of being a static business plan, it becomes this dynamic lean canvas where you run experiments and move forward. So I wouldn't wait for your business plan to be perfect. In fact, I'd say, you know, all great oaks start with an acorn. The best time to plant an oak is yesterday. So you're already a day behind. So get started and evolve. Yes, you want to have an initial starting point, but, but, but spending all your time theorizing what would work is not as good as spending 100 hours in front of customers figuring out what they need. That's a great answer. Um, you know, too many founders have what I call a one-itis. You know, they are attached to their idea and unwilling to pivot. You know, at what point does this behavior go from, you know, a founder with a clear, uncompromising vision going after what he sees as reality to, you know, a founder who refuses to see reality? So that's a really good question. And it's a really hard question because, you know, everyone says no until someone says yes. And then and what if you missed it by a day and all those things. But the question's a lot easier now than it was 20 years ago. Because now you can start with smaller commitments, smaller products, test functionality, then you really have to just be in love with the goal of being a successful startup as opposed to in love with the idea. I'll give you an example. If Elon Musk's real goal was to make a pink car, then he would have made a pink car. But his goal was to make an electric car company for the next century. And although he's pivoted certain parts and learned He's still on that goal. So I'm all for founders being hard nosed and, and bullheaded and focused, but not around pivots. Around pivots, you've got to be ready to learn. The goal is to learn fast, not to stick to your idea. And if you remember the old official definition of a startup, you know, a startup is a novel organization searching for a repeatable, scalable, sustainable business model before running out of capital. So if you're holding on to your idea and resisting everyone's two cents, then you'll probably run out of resources before you smarten up. But if you let go of all of that 
And if you instead let your customers drive you towards solving unmet market needs in an exponential manner, uh, you won't have this issue anymore. You mentioned um, in your mistakes that, you know, not starting is, is one of the biggest mistakes. I see a lot of startups start something, but they're afraid to launch or they're afraid to take it to the next level um, or they're waiting for the right time. What does the impact of timing have in your likelihood of success? Okay, so to do this in the reverse order, never wait. Never wait. Like I said, you know, you got to plant that acorn tomorrow for it to be an oak tree and it, is plant that acorn yesterday to be an oak tree tomorrow, right? But you don't need to wait anymore. You don't need to be wait to be perfect. You don't need to wait to be fully funded. What you need to do is launch and show it to influencers, show it to early adopters, show it and evolve it. Now, the real question that you're asking is, what about luck and what about market timing? And, and it is true that what most people call luck is really market timing. You happen to be at the right place at the right time with the right solution. But while some of that relies on external things like the state of the economy and where technology adoption is going, but if your goal is to have a successful startup, if that's really your goal to be financially well off, to be able to have a successful startup, then you just keep iterating until the market finds you. You just keep getting closer and closer. And that might mean instead of selling doctors, you're selling dentists. Or instead of selling to dentists, you're selling to veterinarians. But as long as it puts food on your table, let it go. I, I think that's great. We have another um, question from the chat room here. Paul says, do you have any good examples from the fire aim adjustment from your experience? Yeah, yeah. So we, my last startup was a cannabis business and uh, we had the fourth license in Canada, but we didn't launch until 34. And our reason was we were too stuck on our original vision. We didn't take our own advice, which is always the problem with doctors and professors. Um, and once we did, once my wife gave me a head shake and, and kind of reminded me that I wasn't you know, drinking my own Kool-Aid, we really started to change. And so we evolved our model uh, into different niches and our model ended up being the most expensive cannabis in the world. That was our, our whole idea and that people would pay for quality. And then on the other end, uh, we wanted to do uh, women for women. So we thought that mothers are a real uh, piece of this puzzle and people have concerns because we've been listening to drug pop propaganda for years. And, and as we started to evolve and let go of what we thought we were gonna be, we got closer and closer to what we became, and that's what we cashed out as. So I can tell you that on the last day, it had absolutely nothing to do with what we thought we were doing on the first day. But we were more in love with giving our friends and family back their money than we were about being perfect to our dream. Alba here from the chat room says that their contractors, which I assume is their clients, they want their projects and services, but they do not want to pay. Um, what would your advice be? So I think that there's a couple problems there. One, if you're offering an exponential value, then people want to pay, right? People don't stop buying Netflix because after 30 days, they, it's no longer free. However, people's perception of value is very, very different. And so if your contractors don't perceive your product as being worth paying for, you need to step back and ask yourself, who else is involved in the chain? What happens if you took all the contractors' data and you aggregated it? Could you use that as a revenue stream? Um, what if instead of charging for the, the software, you charged for its deployment? So every time they used it on your benefit, so what I'm saying is if the people you're trying to sell to don't buy, then either find someone who will buy or find something that people you have access to will buy themselves. So Facebook, we don't pay Facebook to put pictures of our cats online, but we give them our attention, which they then sell off to advertisers. So do we need to have advertisers so that if someone wants to use your free product instead of the $5.99 a week or a month or however you do it, they have to put up with ads. And there's a lot of ways you can test that. Don't get into an ad network, don't hire an agency, just put something in the way of them downloading stuff. 
If you can't finish this CAPTCHA, then I won't let you download it. But I can sell that CAPTCHA solution for 25 cents, right? People don't realize that. You're actually giving the computer information and, and there's a cost to that, but people will buy it. You can see it on uh, Mechanical Turk on Amazon where you can pay pennies for things. So if they're not willing to buy it, take their money in some other way. Put a huge watermark on everything so that they pay to have it removed. Don't let them download it until they contribute something. Or if it's not money, make them contribute something else. Maybe people who sell software to your contractors, maybe they want to sell for, to advertise to them. But again, I think that the new age, it's really not enough just to say my current customers aren't buying. It's to understand what they would buy, why they're not buying, and if not them, who. So for instance, if you wanted to sell something to students so that they could use it in school, you're gonna get zero traction, okay? But if you sell it to professors because it makes their life easier, we're pretty lazy, so we'll buy it. And then we force the students to buy it. So there are different models, and all you need to do is keep iterating until you find a model that for you and your team. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a great answer. You know, um, in the startup world, there is no shortage of people willing you to give you advice or uh, their opinion. How much outside advice um, or influence is, is too much? Wow. Um, it isn't so much a question of volume. It's a, it's a question of telling what to listen to and what not to. So I'll give you a few things that I personally use. This isn't probably the most politically correct answer, but I don't listen to anyone telling me how to do something if they haven't done it themselves. Okay, Ryerson is a great school because every person who teaches entrepreneurship has been an entrepreneur, has been a financier. Everyone who's teaching nursing has been a nurse. We don't just think you could talk about it so we should let you do shit. I think everyone who gives you advice, the lawyers, the accountants, they all mean well, but they've never been there at one in the morning when there's rent to be paid and you can't pay it. So I would caution you to listen to those who have done it. Similarly, I wouldn't hire consultants who sell services. I would hire mentors who have done it themselves and then you just suck it out of their brain. Um, but the bigger question, you know, whose opinion to take? No money, no advice. I listen to customers because I want their money. I listen to mentors because they've accomplished what I'm trying to do. I listen to lawyers and accountants when it's about legal and accounting matters and not business. And I'm a lawyer, so I can insult lawyers. I, I don't know, does that help? I mean, the, the truth is, is that no one knows the answers to these questions. How much will your product be selling in five years? No one has precognition. If you did, you'd make money much easier. But instead, it's about a process. It's about a process that has been used by hundreds of successful companies. And it's about learning through that process. So anyone, including myself and Craig, who tells you they know all the answers, just run away. Because the more I work, the less I know. Yeah, and I think people should have as many contrary opinions as possible and find out what fits them and their business and their business model and their customers. So. Um, it's a question. Yeah, exactly. I, I appreciate your uh, response there. So we have an uh, unfair generic question here from the chat room for you. If you were in your 20s, recently graduated. You mean I'm not in my 20s? Are you suggesting <laughs> the gray hair my children gave me isn't uh, making me 20? Go ahead. Uh, and recently graduated, what would you do in the current economic environment? So unfortunately, this isn't a generic question. I get this question now a lot. You know, we have over a thousand graduates from the business school and a lot of them showed up for jobs that don't exist. In a, in a downturn economy, in a pandemic where uncertainty is out of control, no one's looking to invest in a first year grad. They're just not, right? Other than the professions which have to have a constant cycle, you know, articling students, students that are doing their accounting exams, it's really, really hard. So I'll tell you, you got two choices. You can live with your parents forever, or you can become an entrepreneur. You can take your success under your wing. So when one of my students came to me in May and said the same question, I told her to go get the government handout because she was entitled to it. She paid her taxes every time on her job. She had no shame in that. 
but not to sit around. To go pretend she didn't have that money and start meeting with customers. What kind of customers? Other first year grads. What problems are they having? What issues are they having? And work through that over the four months that our federal government has given you to figure shit out. Now, she didn't create a world changing startup, but she sold over 3000 face masks, each individual, right? And so maybe she's only made about six grand. Wow, maybe, who cares how much? That's better than sitting in your parents' basement pissing and moaning about how bad you got it. So to me, entrepreneurship is about empowerment. It's about agency. Nobody can stop you from changing the world, but they can stop you by not giving you a job. So I, I'm all for jobs. Like I think all my students, even my entrepreneurs, should work five years in an industry, really understand how it works, see the unmet market needs and pounce. But you've got a choice. It ain't like you're turning away work. You know, my wife, bless her soul, works at a travel company and that whole business is in the garbage. So what is she to do? She has to reinvent herself and it's just like you. Now, if that isn't for you, then the only other thing I can tell you to do is try to pursue something that leaves you stronger at the end. You know, learn a foreign language, uh, learn computer coding, all of this stuff is available online in little teeny chunks. Do a hundred steps to start up. I mean, we've opened it up for the world. Uh, take a remote course in, in quality control of software. Don't wait around for someone else to make you successful because it's never going to happen. There's no magic time. There's no perfect situation, but I will tell you this. This has been the greatest change in our history and as a result, the unmet market needs are off the charts. There is no shortage of problems that we need solving. And it's the entrepreneurs who are able to do it. Yeah, and your story about the $6,000, like I think about all the stuff you learned along the way, not so much the $6,000. It's you, you had a business, you talked to customers, you, you found suppliers, you, you had to buy and sell and make all this stuff. There's so much education in doing all of that, whether this is your business you take forward, all of this applies to whatever you do next. Yeah, and I think that it also is a great help to the character of the individuals. Entrepreneurs really have a strong, what we call an internal locus of control. They believe they can change the world, so they're responsible and, and, and therefore they have to do it but they also have a high adversity quotient. They have a resilience, emotional strength. And this is a great time to grow those skills because they're needed more than ever. So the old saying in business used to be location, location, location. Is, is there a new mantra that replaces it? Location, location, location. Yeah, there is. Build, measure, learn. Get off the couch, build an experiment to test your riskiest assumption go and show it to a hundred people and then learn how to make it better. Let me, let me break this down. So I had a student who came to me yesterday and said, they want to have a franchise of restaurants. And I, and I won't tell you what the franchise is, but let's just say it's something ridiculous like bananas. The whole restaurant is bananas, banana restaurant, banana cream pie, banana soup, banana everything. So obviously we're laughing because that's a pretty crappy idea, but that's not the point. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a secret niche of banana loving people that have just been unmet. But he's saying, where do I get the millions to start the restaurant chain? And I said, okay, well, let's learn. So if you don't have a million, what's one level down of a restaurant? Well, a food truck, great. So you could have a banana food truck and you could test your recipes there. So, sir, do you have $75,000 to buy a food truck? No. Okay, that's gone. Let's see, what's smaller than a food truck? A hot dog cart. So what stops you from taking your best recipes down to, I know this won't work now, down to Blue Jays Stadium and, and, and getting people to try it and use that as customer discovery? Well, putting the pandemic aside. What's smaller than a hot dog cart? Because he's only got $25. So I told him to go to a farmer's market, to rent a table for one day, to set up a camera in the open and offer free pieces of pie, free samples of soup. In return, 
for doing a live video customer interview. I give you the pie while you're eating it, I get to ask you questions. That's better than just going to look for the money. Because if you finish the day and no one bought any of your pie when you were giving it away for free, you ain't gonna sell any of your pie when you're charging $9.99. But that isn't the point. The point is, is you don't sit waiting for the millions. You rent the table at the farmer's market and you figure out, you know what? Bananas ain't the way. The way is fruit. We're gonna be an all fruit restaurant. And, and, and again, it sounds stupid to me, but if a hundred people out of a hundred said I love it and gave you their money, that's all the proof you need. And I guess that's really what I'm trying to say in this whole discussion, Craig. The biggest mistake is treating it like it's 1999. We know the path to success. And whether you take you know, disciplined entrepreneurship from MIT or the lean startup from Harvard or 100 steps from us, it's the same. It's about getting started. It's about using data and about testing. So what do you think, another question from the chat room, what do you think is the number one attribute missing in founders that have been, that they have to learn about before they can advance their ideas? What's the number one attribute? Learning. I think, I think people are focused on resilience, they're focused on creativity, but you can learn all those things. You know, I'll always take a hardworking student over a brilliant student. Right? Someone who, who's ready to do the work. And, and to me, doing the work alongside learning is an attribute that not enough people spend time on. You know, whether that means you read an hour a day or you take a course every six months or you work with other founders and other startups, we have so much to learn. And unlike when you and I were young, it's all online. You know, I used to live in the library, but today the library is through Google and it's a whole different world. Combine that with the low cost to launch and the availability of customers. What are you waiting for? Start. Yeah, I used to live in the library as well. And yeah, I actually would role play in D&D and whatever in the library surrounded by <laughs> books. Uh, we have another uh, question. Uh, thanks, Sean, for sharing your insights. Uh, I'm a coordinator at one of the zones at Ryerson and love the value uh, that your 100 Steps to Startups roadmap offers clear direction for early stage founders. Thanks for the plug, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. My question from an investment perspective should, should founders be more focused on showing founder market fit or product market fit? Or is it a balance of both? So that's absolutely fabulous. And the answer is yes. So, and this wasn't a setup question. So for those who don't know, Ryerson has these incubator areas, these accelerator areas, we call them zones. The most famous one was the digital media zone and the biomedical zone. And it's our way of helping the city deal with entrepreneurs, but also to give our students access to them. And this person works as a coordinator at one of them. So product market fit is a much further along milestone. Product market fit, which is defined by Mark Andreessen as when you divide the, the revenue from a customer by the cost to get that customer, it has to be larger than three. And so when Google gets a customer to click, it's only a few pennies, but they can make a few dollars. When Facebook has your grandma join, they get her for a few dollars of memory, but they also make revenue. So the idea of product market fit is much farther along. Before that comes problem solution fit. And problem solution fit is, are there enough customers willing to pay for your product in its current form? So is your solution exponentially better for the customer? Is your unmet market need large and growing? Before that, you have what we call founder market fit or founder product fit. Why are you doing this? If Craig was to tell me he had new software for naval surgeons, I would have to look at him and ask the question, how long have you been a naval surgeon? Or was your father a naval surgeon? Founder market fit is really about sticking to what you know, sticking to where you have 10,000 hours of experience. You know, when I said earlier, I love my students to do five years, you know, at IBM or at Amazon or at Walmart, it's because those are industries and you can learn from them. And without those hours, you don't have insight. So to me, market founder fit is really, do you have any insight to the early adopters? I hope that helps. And thank you for all the work you do. 
And another question coming from an old student of yours. How do you, <laughs> uh, how do you uh, nurture or create an environment to facilitate entrepreneurial skills development for kids from an early age? Well, I had a kid's book coming out, but the pandemic killed Beverly Beaver builds bridges, but maybe one day we'll get it back. But the question is more general than that. See, I don't teach entrepreneurship. I know it's semantical, but I don't. I create an environment that facilitates the learning of entrepreneurship and I pick up the pieces after my students fall apart, right? We have lots of crying and lots of frustration, but that's the process. So to create a safe place, I try to remind people just what a screw up some of my businesses were. And I tried to remind them that this is the process. And so we use a technique called normalizing. So normalizing is when you show other people who have similar jobs and how they do it. So in our class, you know, how to start a startup class in the MT 500, you know, students will do an elevator pitch and then they'll watch six others and their versions of the elevator pitch. And it's when they see other people suffering in similar ways that it all of a sudden becomes okay. Maybe this is okay. Maybe we can learn through this. And so I would encourage all people who are in the entrepreneurial world, you're all part of the same community. You know, we need a kind community. Uh, we need a supportive community. We also need a tough love community, right? We got to be able to tell each other, I think you'd be better if it wasn't pink, right? I think you'd be better if it was half priced. And, and I think that that last line is really hard in Canada. I think a lot of people don't feel they're helping when they tell people less than perfect answers. And I would challenge them on that. You know, I, I, I did some work in Israel and one of the things that, that, that always impressed me was there's no tax. Right? If, if someone thinks it should be pink, they'll tell you through your face it should be pink. They don't wait for the political moment of time. They don't care that you're the CEO and they're the receptionist. That's just the way it is. But that creates such a safe environment because they know they're not attacking you. They're actually trying to help you. You know, it always bothers me when I had to give people on Dragon's Den, you know, hard truths. But my heart was always because I didn't want them to suffer. And I always tell them the same thing. I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. Just ask my wife. And I always promise the same thing. Anytime you succeed doing exactly what I told you not to, let me know and I will write you a letter of apology. The answer to your question, Craig, because I see you smiling, is how many times have you had to write it? And I've had to write it three times, but the only one that you guys will know will be Shopify. I did not see Shopify 10 years ago coming and shame on me. But I got the other 29,997. So we got time for one more question. And I'm just kind of looking here. Um, you talk about pricing a minute ago. Um, you know, and it seems an obvious question, but so few startups really rarely develop a pricing strategy. They just pick a price, you know, based on the competition or out of the air. You know, competition pricing is a strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, but how important is pricing not to undervalue or overvalue your product uh, to surviving the first few years as a business? I think that's really key to the survival. So when we talk about what a startup is, it's a business searching for a repeatable, scalable, sustainable business model, one that makes more money than it costs. So when you, when you look at pricing, it's one of those elements, but I don't get too bent out of shape. I, I try to do the same thing that you just mentioned. I look at the competitor's pricing and then I have a strategy. Right? For the cannabis business, we had a very simple strategy. Add $10 to the most expensive out there and that's our price. We did not, and they, rose, they raised their price, we raised our price. We wanted to be known as the world's most expensive cannabis. And we built a whole brand around how we could get away with that, with 42 ribbons of blind taste tests and all this other nonsense, but it's a strategy. So I don't think you can get the price right, but you can start by looking at competition and then say, am I gonna be the low person? Am I gonna be the high person? Am I gonna be the value? Am I gonna use this as a lost reader? So you need that strategy, but it all starts with just a point in the sand and then you iterate it. You know, we all forget, but Amazon, when we go to amazon.ca or amazon.com, it doesn't show us the same thing. What Craig sees and what I see and what my student sees is different. They have no obligation to offer you the same price. We just assume they do because you don't walk into Shoppers Drug Mart and look at the exact same shampoo and think they could be different prices. But there's nothing that says they have to. 
So they can test all kinds of prices. What if they add a penny? And if thousands of people are going through the experiment, you can nail that price very quickly. But Amazon does that hundreds of times a day, not just with price, but with font size, with recommendations. You know, this is called A-B testing. And, and, and they run hundreds of these. So if they're doing it, I think we should all do it. And that's why I think having a pricing strategy matters. So we got one more question from the chat room that came in uh, uh, about getting into incubators. Do you have any suggestions? Because it can be quite hard uh, to get in. Do you have any uh, suggestions on tips? Yeah. So the first incubators and accelerators really came into fashion in 2008 with Y Combinator and Techstars. Over the 12 years since, we have more than 1,200 of these globally. And um, they, they come into two categories, really, incubators which give you space and community and knowledge um, and accelerators, which do all of that under a strict time frame of 12 weeks and comes with a check of a hundred grand and they take equity. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, but that's the sort of two things. The real answer to how to get in is threefold. One, you need to know what they're looking for. So you don't do that by reading their marketing material. You do that by looking at the companies who were in their last three cohorts, you know, their last three uh, annual team groups. And by that, you can tell exactly where someone is because that's where they put their money. So if they're all B2B and you're a B2C selling some kind of app, don't bother. It doesn't matter what they put on their website. It's what they do in reality. Secondly, you are doing yourself a disservice if you do not manipulate the system. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you need to reach out to last year's graduates who did amazing and meet with them so that you can learn how they succeeded. And when you're there, you start talking about the accelerator to get their appreciation. And if you're good, the meeting ends with them calling the managing director at the accelerator and saying, I know there's a whole interview process, but you know how I made you millions? I think this is the next one to make you millions. And when an investor hears that from a portfolio company, it's just like, what would I not do? Like, why would I not do that? Give me a reason not to, or better yet, when it comes from another investor. So when you're looking to join an incubator, an accelerator, don't just fill out the forms. Do your research, spend time with people. And then finally, the last tip I'll have, it's very new, I haven't even published it yet, but we looked at 30,000 applications to Techstars. And we used artificial intelligence machine learning to try to tell what was really going on, you know, which ones got in. So of the 30,000, more than 1,500 of them got funded. But of those 1,500, just over 50 of them have multiple billion dollar valuations. So 30,000 to 1,500 to like 50. And when I looked at what was most likely to get you from the big pool into the program, this is what I learned. People who don't get in are overly optimistic. They use words like world changing. The people who don't get in are people who are under promoting. They don't actually give you the numbers. The people who get in tell you things like, Oh, week over week growth in users has only been 12% because we launched a new user interface. You're looking for what we call grounded optimism or what, uh, what, what the good to great book calls the Stockdale principle. You have to know that you can beat Google and one day you could be a success. You have to have that in your heart, but you've got to be a realist. You've got to know how hard that's going to be. And you've got to know that it's going to take a long period of time and be very stressful. So that grounded, uh, that grounded optimism or the Stockdale paradox, as it's called, or the Stockdale principle, is what I always think you should do when you're applying. Use the right tone, use the right thing, be proud of your accomplishments, but don't be arrogant. And um, you really hinted at it here, but I, I feel like it's the same thing as applying for a job. If you're just putting your resume in online and waiting, you are, the odds of you getting picked are really low. You know, why don't you try and build a relationship with the people in the team, try and get some the, the warm recommendation, all those types of things. So when someone sees you, you're already top of mind. You have to tilt, do whatever you can to tilt that in your favor to get in. So don't hesitate. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for your time today, Sean. You, uh, I would love you to tell us one more time a little bit about 100 Steps to Startup before you go. 
Well, I have spent my entire life looking for the treasure map to billions. What is the magic path that makes startups succeed? And after 20 years, we think we've found it. It isn't just us, it's the work of MIT and Harvard and Ryerson and everyone else. But we know this build, measure, learn process can be put into steps. So we call that 100 steps to startup. And you can find it at 100 steps to startup.com. And what it does is it takes you step by step through the process, including pivoting and persevering, including making changes. Step by step, one step is talk to 30 customers. One step is buy a domain name. But we've made it so a high school education and a lot of courage is all you need. No good idea required. We'll teach you how to find good ideas and how to evaluate it. No coding required until basically uh, step 50. Um, there's lots to do that will move your business forward. And it's done in a, what I like to call a plain English way so that my sister could use it, so that my students could use it. You know, I, I, I'm not one for multiple syllable words and trying to impress people. Thank you again for all your time today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for all the questions um, and appreciate you giving us all the feedback today. Um, and we're going to see you again in a couple of weeks. Oh, it's always my pleasure. And thank you, everyone.